fact, yeah, some of our regulars aren't here today, so everybody's sitting as far away from me as possible. I'm trying not to take it personally. <laughs> trying. That's all I'm going to say. I want to make sure that the, uh, yeah, the cheap seats, right? Yeah, because these, yeah, I get VIP prices up here. Susan right? says your regulars are down there and are coming up. Yeah, they, 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 they'll, they'll come in as they have time, and that's fine. But we are running a little bit behind this morning because church ran late. And uh, oh, here, here come some of the uh, here are, here are. regulars. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Man, they just keep coming. All right. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm glad you're here. There we go. There, there's a, a fresh lesson for you right there. Well, I don't know how fresh it is, but a little fresh, right? Yeah, I don't know. Some some of these I picked up last week, so you never know. If there's coffee stains on it, it might be an older one. <laughs> and we're starting. Where are we starting today? We're going to be for those of you who have one, page four, I think. Um, according to my thing, it's page four. I think that means it's page four in here. So we're going to we we got through the first part of this one last week, but let's open with prayer, and then we'll we'll get going this morning. Lord, thank you for uh, bringing us together uh, to worship you this morning, uh, to uh, witness a, a reaffirmation of a baptism uh, at the 8.30 service, and uh, to be able to, to hear a good message from, uh, from Pastor uh, Singer. Um, and uh, we just ask that you uh, keep some of those things in our minds so we uh, think about his message to us this morning about us being salt and light, not because of what we do, but because of what you have done. Um, and uh, just remind us that uh, um, you put us here uh, and given us a calling uh, to be in service to the world as we uh, continue to go on and try to make disciples um, in accordance with your word. So uh, just help us to remember those things and see how they might apply in our own lives and um, how, how the things you talked to us about this morning about listening and uh, serving in ways that don't necessarily mean you have to to beat somebody over the head with something, you know, can be really powerful and important uh, in the lives of people who are going through trauma, people who are going through uh, trials like they are in Ruidoso and in other places uh, all around the world. Uh, so we ask that you be with us now, inform our, our minds and inspire our hearts, increase our faith, and be with us this hour, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week we started talking about... Um, the theology uh, and, and the background. In fact, we talked a lot about background last week of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we're doing some comparisons and contrasts of what Lutherans believe versus what other groups believe. And because we had done a section, a session on the end times um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I thought in this interim, before we kind of join thematically with what the church is doing uh, in the next month or so, that I hit on some of these churches that are very focused on end times theology and that we don't agree with or that we we, we have real differences with. Um, and so a couple of the uh, you know, more well-known ones would be the Jehovah's Witnesses, also the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons or formerly known as the Mormons. Um, we'll talk a little bit about them too, but today we're on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, we gave some background um, on them last week and started getting into some of their teachings and, and things that um, there are a few things that we would uh, you know, say, hey, we might agree with that. And then it rapidly descends into things we don't agree with. And so we're looking at why. And so today we're going to focus again on some of the, uh, the things that really come down to a very different way of reading the Bible. When we talked last week, for those who weren't here, we talked about the New World Translation, which is kind of the official translation of Jehovah's Witnesses last week. Um, and that translation... Is, is altered in some significant ways. Um, and it is the Bible they use. And so I, I don't hold any of them to blame for this, uh, but their Bible makes some alterations in the text to kind of fit the theology. Uh, whereas what we try to do as Christians is let the, the Bible text unadulterated inform our theology or we, we say we, we like we endeavor to have scripture always be the source and the norm of our doctrine so the source meaning we get it from the bible and the norm being this is what we judge our doctrines by this is how we evaluate whether uh, we're doing what's god pleasing or not um, and so we try to not do this where we change the the text of the bible to fit a preconceived notion or a preconceived theology um, in this, what we're going to read this morning, though, that's not a place where they've made changes. So what we're going to dig into today is things where they just read it in a really, really different way 
than we do. And we're going to talk about why, because it's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses that this applies to. In fact, I would say in, in, in some regards, their interpretation of what I'm going to have you read this morning might be a little bit more popular than ours. And that was true when we talked about the end time stuff, right? That it seems, it feels like we're in the minority. Not that we are necessarily according to the numbers of Christians in different in different church groups, but because the culture has been so, our, and I mean our Christian culture and also our popular culture has been very um, infected. Uh, that's, that's not a very charitable word, but yeah, I'm going to say infected um, with what we would consider to be really kind of oddball theology regarding the end times. And that's been the case for several decades now. So it's not anything new. Um, but this is going to be an example of where we're not talking about differences in the Bible text. We're talking about differences in the way we interpret the Bible text. Jim, you have a comment? Yeah, when, they, when we talk about they're kind of profit-driven that way. Yeah. Like that would be referring to, right? Um, <clears throat> so there, there's a couple ways I can address that. So okay. when we say they're profit-driven, so they believe that <clears throat> their organization, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, is the only mark of the true church, right? And that to oppose what comes out of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is to actually to oppose Jehovah. So th there's that. And so they consider the leaders of, of their church body, if you want to call it that, of, of their, their group to be authoritative, right? And so prophet in that sense. We believe in prophecy as being anytime God delivers his word to his people through the agency of other people, right? right? That's prophecy. So Pastor Singer was a prophet to us this morning by bringing the word of God to us. Pastor Dan does, you know, our pastors do that, right? Anytime God delivers his word to his people, that is that is a function of prophecy. It doesn't have to do with the future. Often it does, and that's fine if you're talking about things that, that'll happen in the future. We talk about heaven quite a bit around church, right? That's a future thing for us, right? So, but, you know, a, a lot, and, and we talked about this last week, and in previous weeks, that one of the, the areas where, where people kind of get themselves into trouble is when they try to tie very specific Bible prophecies to very specific things in the current world news cycle. And that's where things seem to run off the rails. And we looked at some examples of where people really tried to tie current events, or at least they were current at the time they made these predictions, to things that were happening in the world. And they were sure this means Jesus is coming in 1912, right, or 1914, or in 1931, or in 19, whatever, or the year 2000, right? That was a big one, right? A lot of groups were saying, clearly, that's it. Well, and, and of course, it wasn't. But, and that's where things seem to start running off the rails, is when you start trying to take Bible passages that are meant to communicate an eternal truth about God being in control and knowing all the time frames and him being sovereign over all the time frames and trying to understand exactly what the time frames are. It's not very comforting if I know what the time frame is. That really doesn't do anything for me. Other than I think I'm right and other people are wrong, maybe. I, I don't know. But understanding that God is in control and that even when things are bad and appear to be falling apart, we can know because of what God has told us in his word that that isn't happening outside of his influence, outside of his power, outside of his will, right? And so this is going to be like that. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Revelation chapter 7. Everybody's favorite book, right, is Revelation? <laughs> some, some of you will remember Ron Rosenhagen, um, you know, one of the pillars of this church for a long, long, long time. And, and Ron just despised this book. I might be mischaracterizing it a little <laughs> bit, but he 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 would. I uh, who was it? Uh, I was doing a class on Revelation, and uh, um, I don't remember if I was doing it alone or I was doing it with somebody else. But in the Tuesday morning men's group, he said, "I'm not going to go to that one. Why? It's Revelation. I hate Revelation. Yeah, or words to that effect." Just, you know, Revelation can be tough to understand, right? Yeah. Um, one, you have to have a really thorough grounding in the Old Testament for it to make sense. You have to understand apocalyptic writing, which is the style in which it's written. You have to understand the historical context in which John was given the Revelation. Um, you know, I think all of that goes into to, uh, having an appreciation for the book. Uh, but if it seems mystical and mysterious and hard to you, that's okay. I understand that. Um, there, there are places where it kind of is. 
I don't know that this is one of them, but this is this is an interesting one, and I'm going to tie it to Jehovah's Witness theology versus ours. But let's read it first. Would somebody read for me the entire chapter? This is Revelation 7. It's only, what, 17 verses? Yeah, 17 verses, so it's not super long. Somebody with a strong reading voice want to take that one on for us? I can do it. Okay. Um, then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the sea, carrying the seal of the living God. And he shouted to the four angels who had been given power to harm land and sea, wait, don't harm the land or sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. From Judah 12,000, from Reuben 12,000, from Gad 12,000, from Asher 12,000, from Naphtali 10,000, from Manasseh 10, 12,000, from Simeon 12,000, from Levi 12,000, from Ishtar 12,000, from Zebulun 12,000, from Joseph 12,000, from Benjamin 12,000. After I saw this, a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe, and people and language. Standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. They sang, they sang, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Thank you, Jennifer. That, that, that's a great chapter. That's an amazing chapter in a lot of ways. And it's a, it's really striking how differently different uh, folks can interpret this. But again, how much of what she just read to us do you go, Oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, no, right? It, 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 this this is like what on earth is John talking about here? So, and that's okay. That's all right. But there's great passages in here. By the way, did any of that sound a little bit like our liturgy? Did you did you pick up on that? There's a little bit in there. You go, huh? Seems like we've sung that before. In fact, if you go back to chapters four and five, you're going to find more. How about have you ever sung this? Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to the people of God. That's in chapter five. Yeah. Right? A lot of uh, it's uh, a surprising amount of what we've translated into the liturgy is actually straight out of scenes like this from Revelation. And you go, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really is. And uh, there, there, there's some cool stuff in here. So um, and it's that important that we've got us singing it every week or, or every so many weeks or whatever, you know, and it's part of the regular liturgical cycle. And they're great hymns of praise. So, you know, that makes perfectly good sense. But let's look at how this chapter starts. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Okay, let's just stop right there. Now. Right off the bat, then, do you think this is a literal historical narrative, or is this a picture of a greater truth? Is Earth this square corner? Well, let's see. One's in um, New Mexico. <laughs> oh no! Wait, no, no. Sorry, that's four corners. That's that's not what this is. I guess, I guess this isn't talking about four corners. Um, Anybody ever stood on the four corners? That's kind of cool. You can stand in four states at once. Yeah, I've done that. Um, but right, so you, you you read that and you go, well, clearly this is symbolic or it's it's representing some you know a, a greater thing here. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that we think there are going to be literally you know four angels that this vision that John had was telling us a future event that we're actually going to all witness in person, right? 
Um, and then another angel, verse 2, ascending from the rising of the sun. Okay, just stop and think about that for a second. Having the seal of the living God. Hmm. Cried out with a loud voice to the four angels. Oh, so he's talking to the other angels. Said, don't harm the earth. Hmm. Okay, that's neat. Okay, so, so far, what have we read that you could just take to the bank as this is literal historical narrative or it's going to be a future historical event? Probably not, right? You know, and in fact, we, we saw writing like this in Daniel, too, um, especially the second part of Daniel. After there's, there's a lot of historical narrative, but then there are things happening when, when um, the angel is st standing over the water and so forth in Daniel, where we see this same kind of writing. We call it apocalyptic literature, but uh, so it's referring to something um, that's that where God's conveying a great truth, but it's not meant to be taken as a literal um, uh, historical narrative. It's not something that we can say is going to happen exactly the way it's pictured. We're going to see it with our own eyes, but it's communicating something. And so then we get to verse four. I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And I'm sorry, I didn't warn you that you're going to have to name all the tribes. I should have, I should have let you know when you were reading this. By the way, all the tribes of Israel. Yeah, I, so, you know, I, I know you're intimately familiar with all the details of Zebulun, but, you know, it's okay. Uh, no, but so, and then it goes through and very specifically says 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. From, so that's interesting. What does that tell you? Isn't Israel God's chosen people? Israel is God's chosen people. All those who he had chosen from every one of the tribes. All the tribes were completely equal, right? In every respect? No. The answer is no. Right? No, not at all. But a specific number, so God knows the exact number. Is it 12,000 from each tribe? Does that mean only 144,000 Israelites are going to be in heaven? Is that what that means? No. No, 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 no. It's a specific enumeration, right? It's a definite enumeration, and it's across the people of Israel, right? So all 12 tribes. And so when we read this, we look at that and we say, this, this is a great message of, of, of comfort and solace for the people of Israel. Um, but we don't look at this as a census, right? A literal census that we're going to take at some point. And then look at what happens in verse 9 after that. So after these things, so after hearing about the remnant of Israel, if you will, or the, the faithful um, out of Israel, who's every, you know, he knows every hair on your head. He's got all of us numbered. We're, we're in some accounting system somewhere, but it's not an earthly one, right? Uh, it's a heavenly one. But in verse 9, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from where? Every nation or all nations and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Where else did we see palm branches? Oh, yeah, triumphal entry. Right, right, right. right. Um, so, this is kind of an interesting you know, um, ex expansion of that, right? Instead of just the people in Jerusalem at that time, it's going to be all. Um, but, and, and again, it's not that I think we're all going to be handed palm branches and told, go stand here and make sure you wave it at the right time. I mean, we do that in church, but, you know, I don't think we're going to be doing that in heaven. So, this is picturing something else. Now, now who's this great multitude? So, we just had the 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, 12, do that 12 times, 144,000 of Israel, definitely numbered. Um, and then, who? so who's this great multitude? From all tribes, from every nation, all tongues, all peoples. Who's this? Everyone, right? Including the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Which we see that from the Old Testament through the New Testament, that the children of Abraham are not necessarily born Hebrew. They are the children of the promise, is what Paul calls them, right? Uh, and so, uh, in that sense, you could say we are Israel, but... The people of Israel are enumerated here, and also everybody else is counted in here, too. So, like I said, this is a great passage of hope and comfort that everybody um, that, that God has called to himself will be there. 
And look at that. Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we don't believe that Jesus is actually the son of a, of a sheep. Right? So when we say Lamb, that is figurative, isn't it? Right? When, when, when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Right? He wasn't thinking about an animal. Right? What was he thinking about? The sacrifice, right? Lambs were sacrificed, right? The, 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 the first fruits of the flock, the lamb, the one without blemish, was sacrificed for what? Propitiation for our sins, right? As a, and actually, in the Old Testament system, lambs and other things were sacrificed as a picture of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. And when I say ultimate, I mean that literally the ultimate sacrifice the final the last the complete and perfect sacrifice of jesus on the cross for us so all those all those things in the old testament all those sacrifices were a picture of what jesus would ultimately embody in himself right so this is so now we are all praising him for that still acknowledging him as the lamb which is interesting because this sounds like it's in the throne room. In fact, you go back to chapter four, this is all this vision that John has is really this amazing throne room scene in heaven. And all this stuff is kind of following on to that. And so this is Jesus in his exalted state, but still recognized and addressed as the Lamb of God. And that's one of the reasons that we say eternally Jesus was always going to die. And, and that's that's hard for us to wrap our human minds around. But there was never a point in objective reality in which Jesus was not going to sacrifice himself for our sin. Never. He's always been that way. And even in this scene that God gives to John, he's referred to not as the conquering king, not as the almighty creator. And you could have called him that, but he's recognized in the greatness of his purpose, his, his function of the Godhead, and the fact that he gave himself up for us. So that's that's astounding stuff, right? Um, and, oh, hey, this sounds really first one. Yeah. Blessing, honor, wisdom, and might. Okay, well, it's not exactly the way it's worded, but it's, it's also from uh, This is the Feast, or This is the Feast comes from here, sorry. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And from where have they come? And John gave a very smart answer. Uh, I don't know. It's in the Bible. It's, in, it's right there. Verse 14. My Lord, you know. See, I was, I was even better than I don't know. It was like, you know, don't you? Please, please tell me. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's pretty. I, I, sometimes John's humanity comes through in some of this, and I like that. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white for the blood of the Lamb. Wait a minute. I didn't say these were multitudes from every tribe and nation and tongue and every, everyone standing before them. Wait. So that's an interesting thing when we talk about tribulation. Who goes through it? Everybody. Right? Now, there are specific periods that we can look at historically and say this was a period of terrible tribulation. But notice nobody escapes it here. Nobody escapes it here. And that's why these are great words of comfort to all of us. Whenever we go through things, whether you know it's the as, as severe and extreme as being martyred for the faith, which I don't know about you, I haven't been martyred yet in my life. Okay, kind of by definition, I haven't been martyred. Um, but and neither of you, so I don't feel alone in that. But whatever we're going through, whatever is opposing us, whatever spiritual or physical forces are opposed to us. We come out of the tribulation. Did you see that in verse 14? These are the ones, that, and I, I do like thinking about this one as a future picture, although I think it also reflects our present reality just because the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said, right? We are here. So everything from, from his ascension forward is, is fulfillment of this. But they have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes. And and. In the, in, in the Greek, we, we, uh, we sometimes get real persnickety about the, the grammar here. Um, and this is a completed action in the past. We call it an aorist. An aorist present indicative. I know, I said present there, but it actually is indicating a past action. So this is something that's already completed. And it says they've washed their robes and made them white. How? In the blood of the lamb. There's no other whitening than through the blood of the lamb. 
And so for this reason, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night and so on and so forth. So, you know, like I said, there, there's some great messaging here to us. It's not all real clear right off the top what these word pictures are referring to um, until you really dig into it and you start looking at some, some of the same pictures that come out of the Old Testament. You go, oh, I see what that's tying back to. Some of this ties back to Ezekiel, some of it to the Psalms, some of it, um, uh, some of it not in this chapter, but some of it in other places to Daniel, in other places. And you go, oh, I see what they're doing. And this is a message for people who know the Old Testament. And it's a message of hope and comfort and joy. Now, if you look at your, your lesson here, um, it starts, it's right after the indented part. Um, the statement here is there are only, this is a Jehovah's Witness um, doctrine, there are only 144,000 people with Jesus in heaven. Okay. Is that what we just read? Yeah. The 144,000 clearly seem to be referring to the children of Israel and the 12 tribes. And again, it's a, it's a big number, but it's a specific number, and maybe it's it's a small number if you think about how many Jews have lived over the course of the history. But we're not worried about that it's 144,000. In terms of biblical numerology, that's one of the biggest numbers you're ever going to find in Scripture. So it's a larger number than you might expect just because of its enormity. Just like we talked about a thousand years or the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, and a thousand in those cases is used to picture all of it, you know, everything in the world, everything that God has created. A thousand is frequently used for that. And here we have 144,000, 12,000 from Benjamin and 12,000 from Zebulun, 12,000 know, 12, from every, every tribe. It's very complete. It's, it's all, right? And, but this doctrine, and, and it's, this is one of the harder ones for me to, to explain in a way that, that I can actually make sense of it. A lot of their doctrines I can say, okay, I see where they get this. But this is one of those where they're just reading this chapter very, very differently than we do. They take that literally, that it is 144,000. They are specially chosen people, and they're the only ones who get to be in heaven. So what happens to the great multitude? <laughs> Wasn't there a great multitude in there from every nation, every tribe, every people, right? Um, if only 144,000 are going to be in heaven, where are the rest going to be? On earth. Yeah, so... If you're, if you're saved and you're not one of the 144,000 in their theology, you're going to be on earth, but it's going to be a perfect earth. It's going to be an earth that um, it's not heaven, it's going to be earth, um, but at least you're going to get to exist. And we're going to leave, read a little bit more about that here. So the great crowd here, the great multitude will have eternal life on earth as a paradise. Now, all who are worthy will be resurrected. I thought we all hoped in the resurrection. Um, and after Armageddon, we'll be given a second chance of salvation. This is their, their theology here. The soul of man is not eternal, but mortal, and it can die. Animals also have souls, although man has preeminence by special creation. And after death, man ceases to exist until God remembers and recreates him. Only active Jehovah's Witnesses doing God's will by serving the organization will survive Armageddon, the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth. The remainder of Earth's population will be annihilated with no hope of resurrection. will cease to exist is, 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 is what, what they teach. Okay? Um, in fact, so the next one, uh, it's not really related to this, but, well, it kind of is. Man is created in the image of Jehovah, but willfully sins, since, and so all men are sinners and are of the earth. You know, kind of meaning they can't be part of the 144,000. And so those who follow Jesus Christ faithful to the death will inherit the heavenly kingdom with him. Men of goodwill who accept Jehovah and his theocratic rule will enjoy the new earth. And then, this is important, all others who reject Jehovah will be annihilated. Okay? So that comes up again. Rejection of Jehovah's visible organization is tantamount to rejection of Jehovah's salvation and hope of eternal life. And by the way, most of this I took either straight off of or adapted from um, their materials. So I'm not making this up. Um, this is what they teach. Okay. And so corresponding to that, if your choices are you're going to go to heaven, you're going to live on a perfect earth, or you're going to be annihilated, seems to fail to address something that 
Bible, the Bible talks about from time to time. Hell. Hell. Yeah, hell. So hell means a place of fiery torment or meaning of in our let's put it this way. Hell meaning the way we interpret it and define it, a place of fiery torment where sinners remain after death until the resurrection. It, it has resurrections there intentionally, first and second resur resurrection they teach. Hell does not exist. Okay, in their theology. They they look at those words and they interpret them as just being a place of the dead or a limbo state, something like that. They say that hell, in terms of a place of torment, is a doctrine of organized religion and not the Bible. Uh, it's instead a common grave of mankind, a place of rest and hope where the departed sleep until the resurrection by Jehovah God. So that is not at all what we find here or anywhere else in scripture. So that's that, but it starts to make sense then why they divvy up things the way they do. But you have to kind of start with this presumption that there is no eternal penalty for sin. And there's no permanent eternal um, consequence of death because of sin. If annihilation is your state at that point, what's why do I need a savior? First off, you're telling me I can't be in heaven. The 144,000, by the way, is filled, right? There, there, there are no slots open um, according to, the, to, to what they teach you. That's true. They're, they're very candid about it. So that means we're all waiting for life on perfect earth or annihilation. So there, there's no negative reinforcement at all here. Um, in, in essence, there's, it, it is, which is really weird. because It's like they're removing all the things that the law is supposed to is supposed to instill in you that you are imperfect, and that because you're imperfect, you 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 uh, cannot um, have communion with God. And notice that also, what's not in here is that Jesus is our righteousness, and that we are only righteous because of His righteousness imputed to us. That's a that's a sixty four dollar word, but. Uh, that's basically a, a description of what the Bible says. And they didn't say that. Go back to that bullet. Only active Jehovah's Witnesses doing God's will by serving the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the organization, will survive Armageddon, the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth. The rest will be annihilated. So where does Jesus' righteousness fit? Well, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, not, not the way we teach it, um, but in their view of all of this, you're going to be a knight. So it's up to your personal piety, your personal uh, obedience, whether or not you get into heaven. So, and this all comes back to what we talked about last week, where they say that Jesus is not God, but Jesus is a God. And therefore, his sacrifice was the sacrifice of a man. Sacrifice of a human being only, not a sacrifice of God's son, the way we interpret it. And so, in the way Lutherans look at it, the way most of Christendom looks at it, in fact, all of Christendom, I would say, I would actually exclude this kind of teaching from being a Christian teaching. But in our teaching, it was necessary, and again, look at the whole sacrificial system, it was necessary for there to be an ultimate perfect sacrifice for sins. And that was accomplished in Jesus because he was the one who kept the law completely. We are saved by keeping the law, but not our keeping it. Jesus is keeping it. He kept the law perfectly. And he went to the cross so that we wouldn't have to. He took our punishment. My punishment. Your punishment. Yes, John, I'm pointing. Well, I was pointing between the two. <laughs> you can split the punishment. Okay. That's right. But that, that's so profound. But that whole notion is missing from these, what I would call, unchristian theologies. And to me, that's actually, it's quite sad. They're missing a profound um, thing that God has done for us here in putting the onus on you to be good and you had a comment or a question? What do you think in the scripture that says no one is righteous not one? Yeah. So they let that one stand. Um, what was the question? But it's, it's, 
So Janet asked, so what do they do with the scripture that says there's no one righteous, not one, right? So and I, my point is they, they don't mistranslate that one. That one's okay. It's in there. But they would they would uh, say that in your natural state, that's a true state, but that you can overcome it. And this is what God's grace is to them. It is enabling you to be good enough. So God's name, or God's grace, sorry, is his intention to let you work your way back to him. If you want to look at it that way. That's, that's my wording there. I'm not sure it's 100% the Same way they put it. But yeah, it, it's ultimately, it's, it's, you know, we would say it's works righteousness. Because it's not about the righteousness of Christ. It's about the enabling of Christ passed through to you so that you are now enabled to do the right things to merit God's favor and eternal salvation. Do you have a question or a prayer? Yeah. You know, that, that question, what do they do with their sin? I don't see anything other than a, a curve that is uh, bent by the watch society. Yeah. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why we see them being, and this is just in terms of how they live their lives, very insulated from the rest of the world and very, um, uh, what's the word I'm searching They're groupies. For? They're groupies. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, 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 they tend to stick together so as not to be influenced by teachings like we're just talking about. Yeah. Does that mean why they have church every day? Well, it's not every day. It's only five times a week. Oh, they yeah. have meetings five times a week. At the hall. It's not a church. It's it's a hall. Yeah, they, they have meetings at the hall, but but <laughs> it's still, yeah, so that these teachings can be reinforced over and over and over. And, you know, there are some things about that where we go, wow, that's really pretty admirable. Like their willingness to go out and knock on doors, to do cold calls, you know? You know, as an evangelistic effort, you can look at that from outside and go, wow, boy, we don't do that. Maybe we should do that. And, and I think that's completely besides the point. It's why would you do that? And if you're doing it because you have to, you're doing it as a function of the law, you have to in order to merit Jehovah's grace, mm -hmm. then it's a function of the law only. You know that the law, we read most of the Old Testament, the law kills. The law slays. The law makes live people dead, with one exception, and that being Jesus. So all I'm hearing here is that when they have to know that they've got, they've got to see it in their own lives, and so yeah. they must, they must feel that something about that meeting or something about that witness has somehow purges them of this sin. I, I mean, I don't see it here. I don't understand what they do. Here. So what purges you of your guilt is your obedience to the organization over time. Yeah. Even though yeah, over, over the whole course of your life. Right, right. You keep going and yeah. each time you go, it's a bit of a purging. It, 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 well, I, I, yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, I wouldn't have thought to put it that way, but I'll have to think about that a little bit. It's a little bit of a purgatory on earth, right? Um, it, it really is. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting take. Uh, so, yeah, so... Um, Eternal punishment is the penalty for unrighteousness. This is uh, continuing on with the bullets here. To which there is no end. It does not mean eternal torment of living souls. Annihilation of the second death is a lot uh, is, is the lot of all those who reject Jehovah God and is eternal. That's straight out of their stuff. The kingdom of Jehovah is supreme and as such cannot be compatible with present human government, which might tell you something about their attitudes. Um, right. Which is the devil's visible organization? Isn't that interesting? It's the Watchtower Bible Tract Society is God's visible organization. Human government is the devil's visible organization. And any allegiance to them in any way which violates the allegiance owed to Jehovah is a violation of the Scripture. And so, you know, we know that they, you know, they're pacifists in the sense that they will not serve in the military. There, there are a lot of things that they don't believe in, in recognizing and celebrating, and that kind of informs you as to why. Because if they were to grant fealty to the government in a way that in any way um, diluted uh, their their allegiance to Jehovah, they see that as being um, uh, a horror, a horrific sin. Okay, so in order to gain eternal life, this is probably the focus of this, right? 
In order to gain eternal life, there's several sub bullets here. Jehovah's Witness believes that the following things are necessary. This is straight off of their materials. Right. You must study the Bible diligently through the guidance of Watchtower publications. We covered this last week, and it's it's in the notes here earlier, um, that they believe that you cannot interpret the Bible correctly without the Watchtower or Bible Tract Society. Only God's visible organization can actually properly interpret the Bible. So when we say study the Bible diligently, that's not talking about just personal diligence, but it has to be through the guidance of Watchtower publications. You need to attend all five meetings each week. Devote as many hours as possible to the ministry's work. And that, that can take lots of different forms. Should associate, look at that, only associate socially with other Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and I, I think I talked a little bit about this, and I'll talk a little bit more about it here in a second, um, about uh, people I've worked with who are Jehovah's Witnesses, and you know, we were very isolated from the rest of the company, wouldn't participate in anything that the company did um, for all employees. Because that was that would be fellowship with non-witnesses, and they weren't they weren't nasty about it. They weren't mean about it. They were very nice, very polite. They were the most pleasant people to work with. They were the very pleasant people to work with, which makes sense if you believe that part of you going to perfect earth or what we would say is heaven. If part of that is being a good coworker and being a pleasant person, then you're going to be a pleasant person because that's you're, your that's your motivation. You're motivated, right? And then finally, they must be baptized. And I have a feeling we're not going to get all the way through this, but all right. Witnesses believe that of all these things and more must accompany faith because the earning of the reward of eternal life requires hard work. And uh, I put a reference to the copy of the Watchtower that has been, and the reason I was able to cite that is because it was still posted on, on their website. Um, and, which is a lot of the references I have to their stuff uh, you can still find very easily by looking at the jw.org. Um, okay, so baptism is a requirement. Oh, that sounds kind of Lutheran. I've been told that Lutherans say you have to be baptized to be saved. Is that true? No, that's not what we teach. Do we believe that baptism is necessary? Yes. Do we believe that baptism is necessary for salvation? No. I know this might seem contradictory, but they're not. They're really not. They're really biblical. <laughs> Right? And we have examples like, you know, specifically the thief on the cross. There's no reason to think he was ever baptized. But Jesus <laughs> today he'll be with me in paradise. Right? Um, and so, uh, but who shouldn't be baptized when it comes to believers? But biblically, everybody should be baptized. One is part of the Great Commission. Go forth and make disciples. How? He gives you, he gives you a very simple recipe. It only has two ingredients. What's the first ingredient? Yeah. Baptizing them. And teaching them all that I have created. So when you get baptized, that's how you make disciples. You baptize them, then you teach them. And uh, that's that's what we seek to do. Um, and so baptism is, we would say baptism is necessary because Jesus said do it. But it's not necessary to be saved. You don't have to be baptized for God to save you. What is necessary is that God chose you before the foundations of the world. And you have very little control over that. I don't know. Maybe Steve has more control of it than I do. <laughs> but he's special, I'm sure. <laughs> Notice I didn't ask your wife. I just asked. <laughs> but but that, that's interesting. So what is this emphasis they have on baptism? So here are their requirements for baptism or the things that they teach on it. I do want to run through this real quick. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I guess we're going to go to a third week because I have a lot more to say. Okay. Um, and we have some more scriptures for you, too. The recruit must have previously shown his willingness to study, attend meetings, train for the field service, and actually gone house to house before baptism is considered. Do you think they baptize babies? No. No, no. no they don't. So that just makes them like a lot of Protestants in the United States. Okay. We, we can't use infant baptism as a litmus test. I don't think we should. Uh, but like many Protestant denominations, they will not baptize children because uh, they can't meet the requirements. Um, for uh, to, to be a recruit. So once a recruit desires to be baptized as a witness, he must embark on further study of the subject. Once prepared, he must submit himself to a long list of questions regarding his loyalty to the organization and its doctrines. Huh. You know, we don't even do that to our pastors. <laughs> you know, we, we make them kind of swear an oath on the Lutheran confessions, but why? Because it is a correct exposition of Scripture. Right? The confessions in and of themselves are nothing except that they explain what's in the Bible. And that's why we ask our pastors to agree 
uh, with the teachings of, of, of uh, the Book of Concord, which is our Lutheran confessions. Um, not because the Lutheran Church said so, because the Bible says so. But this is the organization and its doctrines. Only upon completion, and I think grilling is my word, of this grilling, is he issued a certificate indicating that he is a candidate for baptism. He is then registered at the convention as a baptismal candidate and undergoes the actual baptism by immersion in water. Well, we're fine with baptism by immersion. We just don't believe it's a requirement. Right. Um, but so you have to go through this whole process. So this is kind of the epitome of the so-called believer's baptism, which is common in Protestant churches, not us. We're not Protestant in that regard. We don't we don't agree with a lot of our, our fellow Christians on that. Um, but the Jehovah's Witnesses do, but for reasons that probably are a bit opaque to most, specifically that you have to agree with the doctrines and the covenants of the organization. Um, that's a big deal. And it tells you something about why they're able to read things so differently than we are. So a quote from the Watchtower, um, probably when I was first looking at this stuff. Before reaching this point of baptism, all candidates have carefully reviewed the with the congregation elders the Bible's principal doctrines and guidelines for Christian conduct, okay, uh, to make sure they really qualify for baptism. It's until that last part, starting with to make sure that we would say, well, that's a pretty Lutheran practice for adults want to be baptized, right? If adults want to be baptized, we, we you know, uh, tend to put them through a little bit of instruction um, and, you know, to make sure they understand it and all that, because they can. Um, but to make sure they really qualify, we don't declare somebody qualified for baptism. If somebody insists on being baptized and they don't want to go to a class, we'll still baptize them. Thus, the decision to be baptized is by no means a sudden emotional reaction. Rather, each one has proved for himself the good and acceptable and perfect will of God and wishes to submit to that will. And notice they even quote, quote Romans there. So, but they tie that to qualifications for baptism, um, which that passage doesn't actually um, connect with, with connected to baptism at all. Uh, then notice prior to baptism, the elders make sure the candidate understands that the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, as we just read, is nothing less than obedience to the Watchtower organization. Before the actual baptism, each candidate answers these two questions. On the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, have you repented of your sins and dedicated yourself to Jehovah to do his will? Now, why dedication to Jehovah, not Jesus? Because Jesus is not God in their theology. Okay, so that makes perfectly good sense to me if you were a Jehovah's Witness. Then do you understand that your dedication and baptism identify you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with God's spirit-directed organization? Again, that's referring to the Bible, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And then I have one final note here. Having answered yes to these questions, candidates are in a right heart condition to undergo Christian baptism. Um, and so very different look at that and a very different attitude by it. We, uh, we believe what the Bible says when it says baptism now saves you. It's a passive work. The power is all God. We get to participate in it. And that's a great blessing. But we don't try to delude ourselves into thinking that we merit it, or that we deserve it, or that we've met the requirements for it. You know. Um, by the way, this is one of the reasons in our in our rite of baptism, if you read it straight out of the hymnal, we frequently quote uh, uh, when Jesus said, "I'll use King James English here, just because I love it." Suffer the children and do not hinder them, for unto such belongs the kingdom of God. Right. I just like the picture of children suffering now. <laughs> Suffer there means permit, allow, let, let the children come to me, right? And you might remember what was happening there is people were bringing their babies to Jesus, and this included babies, brephus, which is infants in the Greek. They were bringing their little babies so Jesus would touch them. And what were the what were the disciples doing? Tell Father Jesus. Hey, 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 he's too busy. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. He can't do that. And so when he made that statement, he was lecturing his disciples. That wasn't even an instruction to the parents. The parents were already doing the right thing. They were bringing their babies to Jesus to be touched. Right? And so we, we use that in baptism, not because that's a baptism verse, but it's so closely tied to God's attitude towards his children and who he wants to touch. Those who are not worthy, according to human standards, those who are not intelligent, those who do not have the ability to articulate their motivation and make a confession before the congregation, let alone a, a general assembly. And, and the Jehovah's Witness um, 
worldview. Um, that's we do a very simple thing by baptizing babies. I've, I've had this conversation, and I want to tell you this one anecdote. I have I have several, but this one, um, I've, I'm one of those. I always invite them in when they come to our door. Um, and sit them down and we'll talk about things. And sometimes that goes really nicely. Sometimes it doesn't go uh, terribly well, which means they just leave very quickly. Um, I usually blame them for that um, because they'll say, hey, you know what the Greek says here? And I go, yes, I do. You want to look at it together? Okay, okay. That, that's a good way to blow up one of these meetings. Okay, because they don't know the Greek. They don't know it at all, but they're very well trained. And so when they encounter somebody who actually knows then you know they'll extricate themselves very quickly. So I don't do that anymore, unless somebody's really being a jerk about it. And I've, I've had a couple of jerks in my living room. Um, <laughs> but what, before we moved here, we lived in Kansas. Um, the folks from the local kingdom of Paul came by. Sharon was home, and I wasn't. She said, "Oh, my husband would love to talk to you." <laughs> she knows me, but and and, and, and she's it on this program too, right? And she said, "Can you come back?" And so a husband and wife came back in an evening, one evening, and I don't remember if it was the same evening or a different evening, but they came by, kind of made an appointment, that was kind of nice to talk about these things. And so we kind of paired off, and I think they paired themselves off, but the wife and, and, and Sharon went into the kitchen, and I was in the, the, the living room with the husband, and I don't remember exactly why, I think it was because they had a very young daughter that we started talking about baptism, and, and uh, Maybe Sharon had actually asked about that. Have you had your new baby baptized? Or, you know, I, don't, I don't remember how it started, but we got into that conversation. So I'm starting to kind of work through what the scriptures say with this husband in the living room. And then something's going on in the kitchen that I'm not really privy to. And um, at some point it was clear something wasn't quite right. They came out of the living room and this, this lady had a bit of a, a breakthrough moment. Um, and I, I had no part in it. it. Had nothing to do with me. My knowledge of Greek and Hebrew didn't do with this. You know, my my fascination with theology and why people believe what they believe had nothing to do with this. But apparently, Sharon asked her, "But what if your baby were to die tonight and you hadn't baptized?" Her? After looking at what the Scripture says, this lady broke down, and so the husband collected her and got them out of there as quickly as they could. Sure. But it was about the only time I've seen what I would say a visible breakthrough where not it didn't just connect with the mind, but it connected with her heart through that proposition. God loves your baby so much. He wants you to baptize her. That, that got it. So I am not the, the person to talk to you about how you break through the Jehovah's Witness. I don't know, but I, I know I'm very comfortable talking to him. Um, and I love to, and, and we get blackballed. So if, if, if you if you find out that you know what you're talking about, they will skip your house when they come. They were, I'm serious. They've skipped our house for years. And I mean, you can watch them come down the street, visit, visit, you know, or knock, knock, you know, people don't answer and go past our house the next day. And, and that happens until something changes. Maybe they get a new set of elders in or something, and then they'll come back. Or maybe they think we moved. I don't know. But that happened in Kansas. It's happened here. Um, so we get blackballed. I'm currently blackballed. They don't come to our door. The Mormons always come to our door, so I still have something to do. <laughs> What's that? I've actually had that conversation with the, the neighbor to our to our left, uh, Frida Mullen, uh, and, and and she because she was complaining about them one day. She said, "Did you see those people?" I said, "Oh, send them to my place." <laughs> yeah, I, I literally have told her that, and, and she's like, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, really." Uh, but um, at any rate, I don't think Freda trusts me either. But that's a whole other story. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so we're 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 past the end of time today. But I wanted you to see a scripture where we could both read the same words and come away with very different interpretations. And if this was all you were taught, this would be what you know. Sure. So these teachings that I'm presenting here. I don't, I don't take them lightly. I mean, it'd be easy to make fun of my guess or say, that's that's just crazy. But if that's what you've been taught your whole life, that's what you know. And for somebody to counter that is a little bit threatening. And so when we, if if, if and when you give, have an opportunity to counter that, you do that with all gentleness and out of love. Not because we're right and they're wrong, but out of a genuine desire to help them read the scripture and just let it say what it says. 
without the filter of the organization. And I think if they could do that, even reading their Bible, which is mistranslated in places, you know, maybe there's hope. Because they're not going to switch over to my new American standard. I know that. <laughs> right? But I, I trust that God can work beyond the limitations of, of translation and, and human fallibility. I know we can. Right? I mean, he called us. That was, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> and actually, it wasn't. It was very serious, but he did. He called us. So uh, we know that he can work through all kinds of things. Look at the, look at the people you have around you just here at Gloria Day. Would you pick half these people? <laughs> you, you want to. I was going to say, I wouldn't pick you. <laughs> right. I don't think I would pick me. You know? one, one, one of the great mysteries of my life is God made himself real to me in ways that I can't even fully articulate when I was a teenager. Um, and, uh, you know, so this whole thing about baptism, and I think I've talked about this, how I actually asked about getting rebaptized and all that. The pastor told me, no. <laughs> or he didn't just say no, but he explained that, you know, Rethink what, what you're what you're asking for here. Look at what the Bible says. And I came to realize, oh, my coming back into the faith, even though it was 17 years later, was a function of God being faithful to my baptism. It wasn't a matter of me being faithful to God. It was Him being faithful to me. He didn't need me to get rebaptized. If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. Isn't that not what you're doing? That was a reaffirmation, it was not a rebaptism, it was a reaffirmation. But this is why this is controversial in our in our condemnation right now. The whole thing we did with baptism well, Sunday. So the words that were said there, you know, it was it was it was a remembering of his baptism. And I'm I'm very much unsettled by this too. So I'm one of those right now. Yeah, are we teaching the right thing here? Okay, so I'll be really candid with you. I I emotionally i go oh that's really cool that's really neat so there's a there's a part of me that connects with that um i would never do it myself because i would never want that to be an example for my children but that's me what if he's baptized into a different faith with different beliefs wow. so is it a christian baptism i think is what we come back to is it a christian baptism because this baptism that we were just reading about this is not a baptism in the name of the father son or holy spirit with, with Jesus being God, part of it. It's not a Trinitarian baptism. And it has all these weird conditions that make it not a function of God's grace. Right. Except by a weird extension that includes your obedience. You know, so um, I've got a whole excursus on obedience that I won't bore you with now. But um, so if somebody was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, fine, we don't have a problem with that. Somebody baptized in the Baptist Church, we don't have a problem with that. Somebody baptized as a Mormon, yeah, we have a problem. Or baptized as Jehovah's Witness. And I, when I say I have a problem, I think we, we would seek to instruct them on what the Bible says and then ask them, you, would you like to be baptized? And can they still do the Holy Communion? So it, it would be the same thing there because communion is both a, a private and a public thing. First uh, Corinthians 11 talks about this, the public aspect of our, of our, of our, our what we're acceding to when we participate in the supper. Right. Um, so there's a there's an element of it that's purely private. Let a man examine himself. Right. But when we sup together, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's actually a really heavy theological statement. And it's part of our corporate witness. And so, yeah, it, it's it's not a one size fits all answer with, with either baptism or communion. I think, you know, that and that's why we should, you know, we do and we should continue to, to recommend that these people talk to the pastor you know so the pastor can discern what's going on there and if he believes that they need to you know to have some instruction let him do it i mean it's not something that lay people are, are not prepared or ill-equipped to do but a pastor having a, 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 a role that includes shepherding of that flock i think is the right person to go to um, in most cases there might be exceptions but so yeah, oh man, now, now we're 15 minutes late. So we're just like church. <laughs> I feel like I've met my requirements. Oh, well, we are. I got, I got 45 minutes on tape, so that's what we care about. <laughs> Kidding. All right, so there's lots more that we, we can and will talk about. Um, I have a couple more anecdotes that are that are not as interesting as the, the lady who was touched by the thought of not baptizing her daughter, yeah. uh, but they're, they're funnier, so I'll tell those next week. Um, because they, they include me going and knocking on the door with Jehovah's Witness. 
Yeah, and there's a whole backstory that's necessary oh, to make sense. Okay. But, uh, and, and the way I was treated, it's very interesting. Let's close with prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the amazing message you give us in Revelation chapter 7. And we know there are other spots, like in chapter 14, I think it refers back to the 100,000, or the 144,000 again, again, picturing all of Israel. Um, and so we ask that you guide us as we seek to interpret these passages of scripture that maybe are not immediately obvious to us um, or that we, we need help understanding completely. Help us to continue to study and to learn and to grow and to relax. Help us to let the Bible say what it says because you've given it to us. Yes, it's expressed in human languages, but that's the way you've deemed to see it transmitted to us. And so help us to, to just trust that you know what you're doing, that you have us in your hands and that all that we do whether it's good or bad, uh, whether it's smart or dumb, doesn't stop you from loving us and sacrificing yourself for us and saying it is finished on our behalf. So be with us as we go out from this place this week. I ask that you uh, show us those opportunities that you're going to put in our path to serve you by serving our fellow man. And I ask that you remind us every single day just how much you love us. We pray these and all the things in our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Guys. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. And uh, Thank you. I hope, hope you'll come back again next time. <laughs> and if you don't, we can still be friends.